you have to wonder, does Alex Anthopoulos even sleep? This has been absolutely no let up in this news cycle here for the Braves. They trade for Matt Olson, then a day later, lock him up with a massive extension. On that same day, they sign Colin McHugh. A day later, they bring back Eddie Rosario, and then a pair of non-guaranteed deals with outfielder Alex Dickerson and Tyler Thornburg were added the 40-man. We're waiting through it all here on Battery Power TV. Corey McCartney along with Grant McCauley. And Grant, I mean, it was said by Alex Anthopoulos after the McHugh deal that he was running on three hours sleep, wanted to get this <laughs> roster set before the Braves played any spring training games. He wasn't kidding. I mean, this keeping up with this has been absolutely exhausting. No doubt about it. And I knew that once we got out of this lockout where he had plenty of time to sleep, one would think that there was going to be a lot of activity because the Braves had a lot of question marks, some very big question marks and uh, very big questions that we've gotten the answers to already here before spring training games have even gotten underway. And at least as far in advance as open, of opening day as you can be. But yeah, these are all moves that have really shaped what the 2022 Braves and beyond are going to look like. Not necessarily the lower level moves of the non-guaranteed contracts, but when I think about if you go out and you shore up first base and not only do you trade for the answer there, you extend that guy. That's something we'll talk a lot about. Then you're able to go out, fortify your bullpen pretty much on the same day. So the ink is not even dried on that other contract and you're adding a reliever that can be a big deal for you in that bullpen and make it even better than it was perhaps last October. And then you bring back one of your October heroes the very next day and a couple of other pieces that could be useful. Alex Anthopoulos has been going full tilt. And I would say he shows really no signs of stopping trying to make this club better. How much more they can spend, we'll find out over the coming days and perhaps weeks leading up to opening day. But it's an exciting time. And I don't think we see too much of this around the baseball part. Some other sports get to enjoy it. But for baseball, this frenzy and the one right before the lockout have been kind of a different breed, maybe even more so than the trade deadline is some years. Yeah, I mean, the non-guaranteed deals to me, I mean, it's just part of like the chaos of it all, right? That we're, we're dealing yeah. with just this massive moves because, you know, you and I have covered baseball for a long time. And in, this makes me, you know, not envy whatsoever the deal that the guys who cover the NFL and the NBA on a consistent basis have to deal with because their free agency periods are like this more often than not. And here we are just dealing with this avalanche of news. I mean, I feel like I can't turn off MLB Network. I've constantly either got the radio on or the TV on to that. I'm constantly refreshing uh, Twitter. It's just I mean, if you can't escape it. And it seems like every time you do for a few minutes, you come back on and something else has dropped. No doubt. It's just scroll, scroll, scroll on Twitter, trying to discover what the next move is going to be, not just for the Braves, but what we're seeing across Major League Baseball. We're seeing other big deals being signed, some of them that you might expect, some trades that kind of came out of nowhere with guys changing uniforms and going to cities that you might not have thought would have previously been a fit. And then you've got other deals signed by clubs that, are big time money that kind of make you wonder not I'm happy the player gets the money in the case of Chris Bryant, but really surprised that it was the Rockies. So you're getting a little bit of everything. It's not just what the Braves have been doing the last few days. If you're a baseball fan and gosh, you were just tired of sitting around waiting for something to happen over the course of the lockout baseball's back in a big time way as they ramp things up in a hurry to get ready for opening day. But Alex Anthopoulos has been perhaps the busiest of all the executives thus far. And he has taken care of some big time needs for his club, and we'll see what else is in store for us as we continue to march toward April the 7th. Yeah, I think there's 29 other owners, by the way, are waiting patiently for the Rockies to decide they want to pay them to take Chris Bryant a la Nolan Arenado's deal. So, you know, just something to think about for the rest of baseball. But by the way, Jock Peterson, uh, one of the, the first pieces, you know, from that Braves championship run, uh, the major pieces that decide to move on. He's now uh, uh, with the San Francisco Giants. But let's go through what I think everyone has been talking about, and that's the parameters of this Matt Olson contract. Uh, you know, $168 million eight-year extension. Uh, it could go up to $188 million over nine years with a $20 million option year. He's going to get $15 million in 2022, $21 million in 2023, and then it's 22 uh, until 2029 with that option year. Again, a nine-year, $188 million deal and the, the potential of it here. An average annual value of $21 million, and that's just under what you take, you know, and that option year into account. By comparison, the Braves are paying Freddie Freeman $22 million in each of the past two seasons, an average of 16-8 over that eight-year, $135 million deal that he signed back in 2014. Grant, you mentioned it before we started recording here. Uh, basically, Matt Olson got an updated deal of what they were able to ride out there with Freddie Freeman. 
Yeah, it's a continuity deal, I think, if anything. And, of course, Freddie Freeman didn't get his entire 2020 salary. No Major League Baseball player did. But either way, as you look at what the Braves were able to do from that continuity standpoint, it was get a player that you feel is going to profile to giving you what you've been accustomed to. These are two different players. I've talked a lot on Twitter and heard a lot of different, I guess, opinions and uh, vantage points about what the expectation should be for Matt Olson. But I, th- I feel like from hearing him at his press conference, Matt Olson knows what he needs to do. And I think that's the most important thing. It's not easy to be the guy that comes after a, a legacy player like Freddie Freeman. But I do think that Olson has all of the tools to help Braves fans feel at least confident about what's happening out there, not only at first base, but of course in the lineup where he's going to be asked to be the run producer that he was out in Oakland. It's a deal that I think works for both sides. The Braves get their answer at first base for a long time to come. We kind of thought and maybe assumed for so long that it would just be Freddie Freeman and that this was the thing that wasn't going to change in the middle of his career. But hey, here we are. This must feel a lot like Red Sox fans losing Carlton Fisk to the White Sox you know, way back about the time I was born. But it was always one of those things. When I looked at the back of that baseball card, I thought, gosh, why would the Red Sox let Carlton Fisco? He only played another almost decade and a half once he changed his socks. I don't know if Freddie will play until he's 45 or 46 years old, but that's kind of the feeling. As a guy that you look at a franchise and you think this is that franchise guy is now going to be putting on another uniform. And, of course, Freddie said goodbye, I think, very emotionally and very eloquently on his Instagram, just thanking Braves fans and Braves country for all the memories that were made together. I think Freddie's going to get a really nice response when he comes back that first time, because that's the courtesy that he has certainly earned. But depending on what uniform he has on, there might be a few, I would say, different interactions that could follow from at bat number two on for his uh, tenure, wherever that is. But kind of getting back to the Matt Olson part of things, this was the big piece that needed to fall, the big decision the Braves needed to make was what to do at first base. They did it. And then we saw all the other dominoes begin to fall thereafter. Yeah, I mentioned at the, the night of the, the deal that, you know, if you were going to make this deal, I would hope an extension would be, you know, very quickly a conversation to be had. I didn't realize it was going to happen within hours of them making this deal to get him. And again, I mean, off that Freddie Freeman uh, post there on Instagram, I mean, I don't, I don't think with our dealings with him, you would expect anything other than class out of that guy. So certainly is another classy move there for Freddie Freeman. And I hate to, to simply turn the page, but I mean, this is literally where we're at with this club now. They yeah. are turning the page at first base. I really like the fact that, you know, we, we don't know what deal Freddie Freeman is ultimately going to end up with. The expectation was that he was going to flirt with $30 million a year. And if you take Olsen Zeal at face value and, and look at those numbers, I mean, you're talking about him getting $15 million in 2022. Well, that's a lot of extra money the Braves had to play with uh, in terms of what they would be giving, uh, would have given Freddie Freeman. It had, you know, he just came and back on a five-year deal, a six-year deal. So, you know, I think you when you look at the average annual value, $21 million, that's still potential savings. But certainly uh, here, in, here in 2022, it's massive savings. And that kind of leads us into, you know, what happened next there when you are able to sign a Colin McHugh and get a two-year $10 million deal for him to add another right-handed arm to that lefty-heavy uh, night shift crew uh, you know, and certainly the Rosario deal as well, two years, not $18 million. I want to get into both of those guys, but simply, you know, on the surface there, Grant, when you're saving that money potentially with what you would have given Freeman, your guys, what you're getting now with Olsen, and you have that extra money to play with, to meet two uh, needs like this with these two guys, I mean, it's certainly another depth move. Well, think about this. If you're looking at paying Freddie Freeman $30 million a season, if you believe that was what it was going to take to get the deal done, and you get Olsen for half of that, then you just do some simple math, $5 million for McHugh, $9 million for Eddie Rosario, tossing a couple other million dollars on the non-guaranteed deals for the other pieces they got. All of these other signings that have happened in the wake of this will cost the Braves roughly $30 million in 2022. You know, it changes beyond that, but it's exactly what you would want to see is if you did have that money set aside that you felt like you were going to be putting out there that now that you've addressed this need, Got Matt Olson in at the $15 million to start with. Now you can start moving that money to address some of the other needs. I don't know if they're done yet. I would love to see them get one more proven starting pitcher, just somebody like a stabilizer for the third, fourth spot of the rotation. I don't know that it really matters what designation you put on there. We all know who's leading that pack. And that, of course, is Max Fried, Charlie Morton, and then Ian Anderson. And whether the guy you know, breaks up a lefties or righties or whatever it may be, we'll find out. But I think that's the one other need. So if the Braves do have some more money to spend, I would think that will be a spot 
that they could look at. But uh, who knows what will happen with uh, potential other fits that Alex Anthopoulos sees. And as we know, once he kind of keys in on something and decides it's the way he wants to go, he moves swiftly, gets it done, and he breaks his own news more times than not. So uh, we'll just all stay tuned and see if the Braves have any more adding to do. And I kind of like to think that they do before April 7th, but we'll find out. A lot of the needs that they had, the big needs that they had, have already been addressed. And I think there's a lot of excitement growing around the club, even if change has kind of been a theme for the Braves, more so than perhaps any time in the last couple of decades when you think about a franchise player moving along. I agree with you that I think they still need a starting pitcher, but I, I look at them and the free agent market's kind of drying up, right? I mean, we saw Zach Greinke go back to the Royals. I mean, now you're looking at the likes of Danny Duffy and Michael Pineda are really the only, you know, guys that have a an expected fan graph war of over 1.0 in 2022. I mean, maybe they're able to go to the trade route. I mean, it feels like the A's are just, you know, I, I thought we were getting away from tanking, but they are literally giving away everything. So, you know, maybe you can go back and get, you know, Mania from them. You know, certainly they have other options as well. Maybe the Reds, you know, can you can get Luis Castillo, pry him away. They've already done so many moves there. Those two teams, you know, just seemingly unloading everything of any value uh, from the, from their teams. But, you know, certainly the, the free agent market for starting pitching seems to be drying up. Uh, but let's get a little bit into the Rosario deal, which just went down on Wednesday. Ronald Cunha Jr. is expected out until late May for Alex Anthopoulos. That leaves an outfield of Rosario, Marcelo Zuna, Adam Duvall, Guillermo Heredia, and, uh, and Dickerson here, who comes in as a, uh, a depth move. I still have some hangups about you know needing an everyday center fielder. They're potentially going to be going with Duvall there and the potentially uh, Ronald Cunha Jr. when he gets back offensively at full strength. I mean, this looks like it's going to be just gangbusters up and down this lineup, a group that's, that's nasty with a capital M. But I, I do have some kind of concerns here, Grant, about what they're going to look defensively, at least for that first month plus. I mean, a little bit. I feel like Adam Duvall certainly played a serviceable center field. And if you can count on him to play the biggest games that your team can play in any year out there, I think you could certainly count on him to start out the season and perhaps give you a little bit more of what he was doing. He, Looked fine to me. There was not a lot of question marks about it. Is it going to be different than having a multiple-time gold glover like Andrew Jones or even Ender Inciarte, defensively speaking? Sure. Is it going to be a different than having Ronald Acuna Jr. out there? I, I think so. But if we see Ronald playing some center field, the more I've th thought about this and even discussing it with some fans on Twitter, my reservations are just asking him to do more than he really needs to do right off of this injury. Will he play center field again in the big leagues? That's probable. I'm not doubting that. But then, you know, people pointed out, and I'm well aware, he suffered the injury in right field, so he could get hurt anywhere. You can't necessarily just decide that, hey, I'm going to move him here and nothing's ever going to happen. It just doesn't work that way as much as we would like to have with the perfect plan to make sure that players like that don't get hurt. But I don't know that they need to necessarily go out and find yet another outfielder simply based on the fact that he could be the starting center fielder for what amounts to 30, 45, maybe 50 games before Ronald Acuna Jr. gets back because I kind of feel like if he's got no setbacks, he feels strong, and the Braves get into the month of May, it's going to be a hard time holding back for three or four more weeks just waiting for Ronald. But it's the team, the doctors, and the player that have to make that decision as to when he's ready to have that, that governor taken off and allowed to go full speed and do everything that he possibly can do in a Major League Baseball game for the Atlanta Braves. That's what we're all looking forward to. That's the goal. But I think Duvall is good enough in center field for that amount of time to give Atlanta what it needs. You have Guillermo Heredia, who is a center fielder by trade. You could utilize him some if you need late innings or to make some changes. Brian Snitker wants to go a different route, do some pinch running, perhaps different switches that would need to be made. There are some pieces there. Yeah, I mean, Duvall can clearly handle it. I mean, he started there every game in the postseason, had four defensive runs saved. He made 29 outs out of his own plays and 210 and two-thirds innings uh, in his career in center field. He's just never done it consistently uh, at the position. I think that's, you know, kind of where I'm at right now. And, you know, certainly yeah. Rosario, two defensive runs saved in left field. He, he's, he hasn't, though, had a positive uh, defensive war in a, in a season uh, defensively since 2018. We all know the defensive limitations of Azuna, who was last positive defensive war was in 2015. Uh, I just feel like those games where you have Azuna, Duvall, and Rosario isn't optimum defensively, but certainly, you know, as you mentioned, you can bring in Heredia as a, you know, late inning defensive replacement, uh, Dickerson the same way. I mean, he's been a, you know, a, a positive defensive player as well. So they have lots of options. I just think I'm, I'm mm -hmm. kind of with you where 
you know, we, we, we saw, you know, Acuna be so much better in, you know, a corner spot. And I think that's where everyone really likes him, but certainly, you know, what are you giving up offensively to have a look where you just put somebody else in center? So I think from a lot of different standpoints, it, it, it does make sense. I, I'm, I was surprised to hear that the conversations were already had with him, but certainly, you know, you think about offensively with all those play, pieces in play and Rosario, of course, who was the, you know, one of the heroes of the postseason run, the NLCS MVP, you know, just absolutely a, a dominant uh, postseason out of him. Um, you know, I, I, it's getting him back uh, and what it means to what to offense to this, this offense. I mean, it just can't be understated. No, and it's having another left-handed bat that can help you with that aspect of it. I know that was a big concern with, you know, what if Freddie Freeman leaves and what do you do at first base if he can't get another left-handed first baseman and all of a sudden the only lefty hitter you got is the switch hitting Ozzy Albies. But that is not a concern as we sit here 24 hours after all of those moves or less than 24 hours after some of those moves have been made. So I think that's important. I know Rosario is not a big defender in terms of adding a lot of value to his overall resume, but he does enough offensively and he does just enough, I think, it, it, on a regular basis to handle himself adequately. And that is kind of what I expect out of Duvall. And he may surprise you out in center field. I know he surprised me with a few plays in the postseason. I just I feel like he's capable of it. Really, the only thing I worry about with Duvall or wonder about with Duvall is what if he goes into one of those long slumps? What are you going to do when that happens, if that happens? I mean, Adam Duvall has a ton of power. He's come in and, and come up with a ton of big hits and home runs for the Braves in his tenure there. But there's a lot of swing and miss in that game. And sometimes he is prone to get into those longer strings where, you know, things are just not going his way at the plate. But once you traded Christian Ponche, who was truly the only guy that I was curious to see if he might get some reps in center field based purely on the glove that he has, I think you, I don't say back yourself into a corner, but you pretty much committed center field to Adam Duvall barring some other move, particularly after you've gone out and gotten Eddie Rosario to add him to the outfield mix. A lot of different pieces that the Braves and Brian Snitker have to figure the puzzle out. And I think that they should feel pretty good. If you look at all, you know, all 30 clubs, what you're doing out there in the outfield and what you're doing with your lineup, the Braves are pretty loaded in that respect. And if they can put a bunch of runs on the board, maybe they don't have to worry as much about trying to stop every single run. Maybe the pitchers can do a little bit of that on their own. Yeah, I mean, obviously they're well equipped with the designated hitter and you feel like that stops you from feeling like yeah. you're giving up too much defensively when you think about trying to find a way to either have Azuna or, you know, Rosario out in the field and get one of them a day off. You don't have to worry about that. They can both be in the lineup at the exact same time. You mentioned the pitching uh, on to Colin McHugh, 126 career starts, uh, but Alex Anthopoulos was clear that they have no interest in him starting, uh, even, you know, even if, if there's an unmet need, as we feel on the rotation. Um, he had a few trips to the IL last year, but posted a 155 uh, ERA in 64 games over 37 innings, a 30% strikeout rate. I um, mean, think about the way that the, the hit that the Braves bullpen took, Grant. I mean, certainly Jesse Chavez, Chris Martin, Richard Rodriguez, Josh Tomlin, all hitting free agency. Um, this gives the Braves another high leverage reliever, all there, you know, uh, certainly another righty uh, to have with that really hefty, uh, lefty heavy group there of Will Smith, Tyler Masick, A.J. Minter. They do have another fellow righty in Luke Jackson, but um, this really uh, bolsters that, that uh, bullpen without question. Yeah, when we talked a few episodes ago about what I felt like the needs were for the Braves, I brought up right-handed reliever. When we got done, we, we thought about, oh, well, Kirby Yates did already sign with the Braves, but he's kind of a second-half addition for, the, for Atlanta if everything goes well with his rehab from surgery. So you couldn't count on him here early on. So I really did feel like one more proven righty reliever would be a huge boost because you do have Jackson off from the right side. You'll get Yates and you have three outstanding left-handed pitchers and guys that have done the job at the very least. So they're set up really well out in the bullpen. We'll see if Darren O'Day can add a little bit as well, because he was signed as a minor league free agent and he has a chance to make the club out of spring training as well. And crazier things have happened with Darren O'Day and the Atlanta Braves in terms of making rosters as he did back in 2019, after not pitching for most of the season ended up on the postseason roster. And there are some other arms that could get a look in the bullpen. We know Sean Newcomb is back. He's out of options now. Tuki Toussaint's a guy that has big-time stuff. How would that play in a bullpen role? I don't know. Or will he begin the season starting at AAA Gwinnett and being on the ready if the Braves need a starting pitcher to jump in rotation should there be an injury or some other thing that comes up? 
it's a, a good group. And, and this is what you want is you want the layers of depth and you want to be talking about the different pieces and possibilities. And the Braves have put themselves once again in a great place to not only be a contending club, but a team that looks pretty dangerous and pretty capable of making another long run through October and perhaps climbing the ladder and pulling down the title. I love Luke Jackson's quote. He said it was a, it, it was a bag of misfit toys. Now it's like there are actual toys out there. It's a toy store. Um, McHugh, by the way, a 205 average against with runners in scoring position in 2021. Lefty said just 163 against him. Most importantly, though, he can throw multiple innings. He did so in 25 of his 37 appearances last year. You, I mean, you mentioned Kirby Yates. He's on the 60-day IL now on that Tommy John uh, recovery. Uh, Thornburg, you know, they, who they bring in, at least provides another righty option. Uh, they have injury injuries, though, you know, kind of kept him from being a real reliable option since 2016. But the question, you know, I think at this point, Grant, is, is you have to wonder, are they done? I mean, the estimated payroll right now is at 168 million. Anthopolis has said that payroll was going to increase this season. Uh, it's now 21 million over the final pay, uh, payroll of 2021. This is the highest, by the way, 40 man payroll in franchise history. But, you know, we mentioned it there. It still feels like there's need there. I, I just don't I, I don't know if there's room. I mean, how much higher is, are they willing to go with this payroll? Well, I don't know if it's necessarily just a payroll thing, but you also have to think about where you're going to play some of the different guys if you keep bringing them in, because there's not as many glaring or, or, or huge needs that the Braves would want, not want to go into a season trying to address. Like what if Freddie Freeman signed somewhere else? Matt Olson was traded to some other club. And then you couldn't sign Anthony Rizzo or another first baseman that made sense for you. And then you're sitting around waiting with nobody to go out. Well, you're the last one on the dance floor, honestly. And Alex Anthopoulos has never put himself in that position. He didn't again this year. And it's uh, refreshing to see that after the Braves had some lean years prior to his arrival and prior to beginning their run to October in 2018 and winning these consecutive division titles. And, and probably so in 2021, not only winning the division once again, but making their march through October that ended in the team's first World Series championship in 26 years. So this club looks as good, at least, as the one that won it all last year. And I think Luke Jackson's on to something. It might not have come together in the way that you thought that it would, but the end result you cannot argue with. And it looks like the architect of that and the man who pulled all the right levers at the trade deadline last year is not asleep at the wheel. He's been working very hard and putting the Braves in a position to contend and, and do so for a long time. When you think about the stability of the core of this team, maybe some more extensions will be down the line and you'll look to keep some of these players locked up in a Braves uniform for a long time to come. Well, you know, as they say, Grant, bad, uh, bad times don't last, but bad guys do. And, you know, the Braves are certainly in a position to be the bad guy here for the rest of the NL East for quite some time. So don't blink. The Braves may not be finished, but make sure you stick with us here on Battery Power TV. So get to the Battery Power YouTube channel. Turn on those notifications. A nice little alert going. So drop you one every time we push out a new episode. I'm Corey McCartney. He's Grant McCauley. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in next time, Braves country.